Well, it's certainly changed a lot with the pandemic and quarantine, mm-hmm. but also really hasn't changed that much. I think, you know, for the most part, it's, Hey, what's going on, everyone? Jim Alexander here with Real Talker. I am joined today uh, by the man that composes a lot of music in shows and TVs that you will, um, well, in TVs, uh, in shows and movies that you will see, Mr. Jackson Greenberg. Jackson, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's <laughs> We tried to make it happen before, it kind of fell through, but I'm glad to finally have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, for some, I want to start out for someone who doesn't know much about composing, what it takes, what it really is. It's basically a lot of the music you hear in a show and a movie, the, the background stuff. Tell me kind of what you do for the person at home that might not kind of understand or fully grasp it. Um, and even me in a sense, you know, there's some points of composer. I still don't understand uh, what you guys actually, you know, fully do. Uh, tell me what entails your job. Um, kind of from the basics of it. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people confuse us maybe with music supervisors, like Mm -hmm. when people um, notice music most of the time in film and TV, it's usually because it's a song that they know or someone's singing. Um, But we write most of the music that people don't notice unless you're really looking for it or paying attention to it. So a lot of the TV shows that I work on have music almost in every scene and uh it's really underscore it's it's designed to be in the background and kind of um emphasize the emotion and the action that's happening on screen but not detract your attention from what's happening on screen so you know for the most part we go pretty unnoticed but um i'm writing producing original music um from scratch for content for television and film Um, that's original to each piece and each job that i'm hired on how do you approach that? Is there a sort of kind of a checklist that you have or, or you know, that you approach each show, each project with uh, when you get the project? What is kind of the first steps that you do uh, that kind of leads you to that process where you eventually end up with the score for it? Yeah, most people don't know this, but music's really, music and sound effects are really the last pieces of the puzzle, you know? So mm-hmm. generally when I'm hired onto a project, they're pretty close to being done. Um, with the edit, what the film's going to look like, the structure. And generally they've been editing either to music of mine from previous projects or other people's music. And, and so the first step is to kind of um, sit down and, and watch where they're at with the film, um, generally without music, and just start to think about what is the role of music going to be in this project? You know, is there, um, why are we using music at all? Where are we going to use music in? And once we decide the places where it's going, kind of starting to have conversations about what we want the, the film to sound like, what instruments, what, what places, what, you know, how do we want the music to make us feel? But the, really the first step is kind of sitting down and, and watching the film without music and choosing the places where um, the director and I think that music can be uh, helpful to the viewing experience and additive to the film overall. You know, when I think about composing this stuff, I usually think about sitting in a room in, in a dark room, you know, just yeah. working on your music, working on your beats, just complete kind of isolation. Tell me how much of that is a reality and how much of it is collaboration with the director and whatnot. What is kind of a day-to-day once you're on the project and you're in the midst of it, uh, what does kind of the day-to-day look like for you? Well, it's certainly changed a lot with the pandemic and quarantine, mm-hmm. but also really hasn't changed that much. I think, you know, for the most part, it's, it's me and my studio. This is like the entryway to our studio. So it's pretty bright, but you know, where I'm writing is pretty dark and writing to a scene and then posting it onto our kind of online um, portal and, and receiving notes. And then kind of the notes form, you know, is, is either written notes online or, or notes that they call or they text. And then generally the part that's been missing now is generally at the end of projects, directors like to come in and sit in your room and have the full listening experience on the big speakers. But, you know, for the most part of the day to day, I I'm just by myself in the studio writing music and the people that I tend to interact with are other musicians and Mm -hmm. instrumentalists that I'm recording. 
Um, I share my studio space with one other composer who has his own room. So we generally have lunch together and get a bit of socialization in that way. But, you know, I, I had been on the road a little bit with some different bands and I had been touring and, and playing out in LA. And I kind of at some point realized that I, I'm much more comfortable and just kind of being by myself in the studio and coming up with ideas and um, in, in the quiet, dark spaces, as you called them. How much of the work that you do is at in the office, in the moment when you're, you know, kind of ready to be working on? How much do you, in a sense, do you get of the ideas or certain things when you're not working, you know, just kind of maybe doing everyday things and then something comes to you? How much of it is in the studio that happens and how much do you kind of spontaneously get uh, in just, you know, outside of the studio? Yeah, I think especially at the beginnings of projects when you're trying to come up with ideas whether that's like a, a melody or a tune or even just a process like you know this last film that I did I I used an underwater microphone so that was an idea I think that came to me when I was outside of the studio but what does that I, consist of underwater microphone tell me more about that yeah actually if I found it I, I had seen it because I went on a friend's fishing boat and he kind of dropped his mic, this thing into the water and we were able to hear the sounds of whales. Wow. Um, and so I went online and I bought one from Europe for like $60 and you know, you kind of, it's like a guitar amp, you plug it in and then you just drop the microphone. It's a little piece into a, into a bucket of water or, you know, and you can record things that way. And those ideas, I think, especially at the beginning of the project, I'm thinking about kind of throughout the day or, or, and, you know, recording little, things on the piano and recording them onto my iPhone and um, and then as you move you know you move forward and and it becomes more about like you know what the general the big ideas are solved and you're working on individual scenes then it becomes a try and kind of leave the work at the studio and because I used to have you know a couple of years ago I had a home studio and mm. I have I was really bad at stopping until you know something was perfect or something was done and now that it's a separate space I think I've gotten better at, you know, leaving things till tomorrow. And sometimes you show up the next day and, you know, the idea is not as bad as you thought it was the day before. And, and so I think some time and space is, is good for the process. That's interesting, you know, versus I always wonder, because this is technically something you could set up a studio at home. Maybe you have the right equipment, you know, you, yeah, you, definitely. I, it's, it's doable for sure. So it's interesting to hear a perspective of what it was the difference between actually going into a studio. It's kind of like working from home, you know, you can do yeah. it. A lot of people do it, but there's something still about going into work that makes you more focused in a sense. And you know, you have that time designated there. Yeah, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to each but I think for right now where I'm at in my life I, I've been enjoying kind of going in you know to a different space plus you, you get a fellow composer which you at least have lunch with right so that helps yeah no which actually makes, makes a huge difference it really does and mm. he's a, he's been a good friend of mine for a while I was the best man at his wedding and so it's just nice to have a friend you know at That's work cool. tell me about the the latest project aka JM. Jane Rowe that, you, that you're working. It's a, it's a Hulu project. Uh, tell me about this for, for those that haven't seen it, maybe. How did you kind of approach, approach the music to that, too? Because it's, it's a hell of a story. Yeah, it's, you know, it's Hulu FX first kind of big feature length documentary. And Nicholas Sweeney and Jamie Karasawa, the producer and the director, um, they were editing to a lot of my music from a movie called City of Ghosts, which mm -hmm. was about um, an undercover news branch in Syria that were the first people to kind of tell the world about ISIS. You know, they were risking their lives to report on ISIS. And so that music was very suspenseful and tense and uh, almost like a spy thriller in some sense. You know, these people were risking their lives and having to send information out into the world. Um, secretly. And so it was curious to me when I got approached to do this documentary about, you know, Roe versus Wade, um, that, the, that that was the type of music that they were using. Um, mm. I wouldn't have thought that, you know, a movie about a, a court case in America could, could use the same sort of kind of anti-terrorist music that I had written for that other movie. But then when we got into the material and I learned that, you know, the story wasn't about, about as much of the court case, but really her life, Norma McCorvey, um, Jane Rowe. 
and how she was kind of recruited by the other side of the argument and how they really like approached her as if she was some sort of spy herself and paid her to go out and deliver information. And it was, um, it was their idea really, I think to use that music, that style of music. And then from there it became kind of, how do I write music that feels suspenseful and feels like a spy thriller, but also is grounded in like the, you know, the intimate nature of this person's life. And so it feels both kind of big and small at the same time. It was a really big challenge and I'm really thankful for the guidance that the team provided me of always like kind of steering me back to telling her story as opposed to trying to get too big with it. Mm. You know, it's interesting because you worked on another project. I really enjoyed the cartel land and that's a hell of a, that's a hell of a project there. Tell me, you've done a lot of these documentaries in a lot of ways and what's the approach to doing a documentary scoring that versus a, just a regular kind of a TV show or a film that's, you know, fictional versus something that's, edged in reality and you know that compelling thing that you need to hook the audiences that's actually you know a true story that you're telling and um and the music approach to that is is there any difference when you approach a documentary um that have these intense moments versus like a fictional you know comedy maybe tv show yeah i think like you I always, you know i got this advice from some composers that i studied with but i always try and put myself as a, as a big fan, as someone who really enjoys watching film and television, whenever I'm working on a project, I try and put myself in the seat of the audience and take a step back and feel like, well, what would I appreciate musically as an audience member? And I think just in the, the nature of documentary, I think has changed a little bit, but for the most part, um, people want to feel like they're, they're still grounded in reality, right? Well, as if you're watching a comedy TV show or you're watching like a fantasy show, a fantasy show or a, fan, a game of Thrones, I think the music has a little bit more leeway to kind of lean into the, you know, how big those, those shows are and how the scope of them. Whereas in documentary where, you know, mostly it's stories being told about everyday people that, you know, we have encountered in our lives. And, and so it's a really thin line between, using the music to tell these people's stories and add emotion and provide this, you know, connective emotional tissue between the audience and the film. And, but you never want to kind of cross into that territory where you make, you're making people feel like they're being manipulated, you know? So mm -hmm. especially on Jane Rowe, like, I think that was what was really helpful is like, sometimes if I got too big with the music, we would have conversations where it's like, you know, really this is a, a movie about one person's life. So like maybe, just always try and be writing from her perspective of, of telling her story as opposed to a, a much bigger story of a country or a court case. And, you know, it's, I think it's the biggest challenge that you hit on in documentaries. How do you provide emotion and, and, and move people with the music and the storytelling without really making them feel like you're, you're doing too much, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. I'm constantly just trying, trying to take a step back and watch it and see like, how would I feel if I was watching this as an audience member? Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's my day-to-day -day experience is just trying to detach myself from my own music and really tell myself like, it's not about, it's not about the music. It's not about me as a musician. It's about the, the film and the characters and telling their story which was a big challenge, you know, to, to take a step back and say, you know, this is not, this is not about me. Right. Yeah. You got to put everything aside, you know, miss your thoughts and a lot of things too in that way. You know, I wanted to jump into the fact, what, what are some of the biggest challenges a composer faces? Like, especially what are some difficulties about your job um, that you constantly have to navigate through? Yeah, I think one of the one of the biggest ones is that you could spend a week on a piece of music on one scene and then you could play it for a dire the director or the producer or whoever's in charge of deciding ultimately what the music's going to be. And, you know, you could spend a week working really hard and go home feeling like it's the best piece of music you've ever written. And then within, you know, two minutes of them watching the scene, they can just text you no, you know. And, oh, and so learning to deal with that type of, rejection and I'm hesitant even to call it rejection at this point because I think in the beginning of my career I felt like it was a type of rejection and now there's been so many cases where I've been I've had a director say no and then you know 
a couple weeks later they change their mind or I'm able to reuse that piece of music on a different project. And um, I think if you can reframe it so that you're, you're like, okay, this is not my film. This is the director's film and develop a level of trust and, and like really truly believe that they know what's best for the project because they've been living with it for years in some cases. Um, but that, you know, it still is, it's definitely heartbreaking sometimes still, despite like my attempts to, recontextualize it in my mind but that I would say you know that's a huge challenge is like I think every composer anytime you write something you're you're putting your heart into it otherwise we wouldn't be doing this job and and to have sometimes such like immediate rejection of something that you put a lot of your heart into it can be very emotional but I think yeah as I said it's being able to take a step back and recognize that it's not personal and that oftentimes you know, you can store that music away and, and repurpose it for something else in the future. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting perspective to have. And, and you got to have that mindset or else you'd crumble probably every time. <laughs> things don't, don't, don't go, you know, the way you would hope it would do. Yeah, I guess it is. It's a form of self-preservation in some sense. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of wondering, is there a general time frame that each project has um, that you work on or, or it varies a lot? And what do you do between projects? Is there like a cooling off period where you work on something, you know, you put in your heart and soul into it, and then you kind of got to clear your mind, you give or allow yourself some time off in between jumping into the next project, or you just like to jump into the next one? What's your kind of approach when it comes to the time frame of the project and what do you mm -hmm. kind of do in between them? Yeah, I generally tell people that I'm working with that I would say like an average 90 minute documentary takes about five to eight weeks to do the score, mm -hmm. depending on how complicated the music is. And sometimes it doesn't take as long and sometimes it takes longer than that. Um, but there's so, you know, there's so many moving parts of are they really finished editing? You know, do, do is the type of music that they say they want that you start writing ultimately what they do want. And so, you know, you try and give yourself a big time frame and uh, but, you know, I've been on some TV shows like dating around of Netflix season one where I was mm -hmm. turning around, you know, an episode every week. And so it's like, wow. you know, you, it, for the most part, it feels pretty intense. But every once in a while you get a project like this last one that I just finished for Netflix um, where you, you know, maybe it was a result of the quarantine, but we really did have time to to experiment. And those are always the best ones when you don't feel the pressure of the deadline and you know there is a deadline so you're still working towards something but you have enough time to really experiment and run different ideas past the director uh, in terms of in between projects i think it depends on are the projects similar in in a sense like i you know you i, I feel like i'm still learning this about myself because i was ready to jump right into the next project last week after i finished and i sat down and I couldn't, you know, I wasn't ready. I needed some space. And, and so I took a couple of days to kind of reset and restore. And um, I think that's really important, but sometimes, you know, we have projects that are overlapping and we don't have the benefit of that. But I think in an ideal world, there would be time for me to go out into nature and camp and go hiking and kind of reset. And I draw a lot of my inspiration and energy from those type of things. So to be able to recharge those batteries after, you know, becoming deficient in vitamin D after staying in the studio <laughs> all the time is like, I think really important, but you know, it's also a hustle. So sometimes you don't have that opportunity. You just have to kind of move right into the next one and, and, and start right away. But that's always a big challenge for sure. Well said. Well, listen, I, I think you've done some great work. I've seen the shows you worked on and I think people don't realize how much a, a score and, you know, the music composition matters to a film unless you take it out. It's one of those hidden kind of underlying things, you know, where, where you, you just kind of are subliminal to it. Where, where unless it's just, you're, you're a good friends or family member with a film composer and then you don't need to pay <laughs> They point it out, right? Yeah. Um, but, but it's cool, man. And I always pay attention. I mean, some of my favorites, obviously, you know, it, it's, it's gotten to a point where now I feel like composer being more acknowledged before you have, you have your Hans Zimmers and John Williams and Zach Helmsley, you know, you, you see, you have guys that you know, right away are, whoa, like you are kind of anticipating to see what they're going to do. Right. Um, have you noticed that also that, that your profession is kind of becoming more in a sense, 
you're noticing some of the stars. I mean, you probably internally knew who, who the great yeah. ones were, but now it's kind of becoming mainstream in a lot of ways. You hear about some of the great composers and people actually looking forward to their work. Yeah, I think, you know, it's the music industry has changed a lot, whereas, you know, record sales have in some ways been replaced by touring. And so we've seen a lot of um, really inspiring people like Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman. And Danny's Danny another one take their shows on the road and do these world tours and play Coachella. And, and as a young composer, those things are really inspiring to me to see. I don't think th that was happening before. And um, I also think the advent of video games and the importance of music there has, has drummed up a lot of enthusiasm for what we do. And then I would say you also see people like Trent Reznor who were really well established as rock and roll stars with nine inch nails kind of, yep bringing a lot of their fan base and awareness into into film scores with films like the social network and bomb girl and stuff like that and yeah i think those for those reasons and more you're seeing a lot of a lot more awareness which I, is great i i love it i think it's awesome and it's, so many people are doing such great work and it's inspiring i think we're all that's the cool thing about music is like there is a level of competition where you you know you do want to be working on your own things and pushing yourself but at the end of the day like you know, there's, there's not really a winner and a loser. Like you hear a piece of music that someone else writes and, and it can motivate you to, to feel something or write something better yourself. So it's mm -hmm. a cool community to be a part of. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I get to do this every day. That's cool. We'll keep on doing the good work. Where can people find you? Is there any website they can look, you know, yeah. follow your work and, and follow you in a sense? Yeah, jacksongreenberg.com. Uh, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for, but I'm pretty good at updating that. And um, a lot of my music that I'm really proud of is on Spotify and Apple Music and um, have some kind of vinyls for sale of some different things on the website. And uh, yeah, my email is on there as well. If anybody wants to reach out, awesome. always, always down for a chat. There you go. And well, thanks for chatting with me, Jax. I always enjoy speaking to kind of the people behind the scenes, whether it be composers or, or you know, um, like directors. It's always interesting to see the other side of the, the business and, and what it takes, you know, to make that one big project. It takes, um, takes a lot of cooks, you know, in, in the kitchen yeah. to make that great meal. So um, you're definitely part of that and, and definitely enjoyed some of your projects too, and the, the, especially the docs that you've been part of too. So that's really cool. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for, for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for your support. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Catch yeah. up down the road then. Stay for safe sure. and stay well. You too. Thank All you. Right. Bye, Jackson. Bye.